Um, my name is Luc Bourreau, I'm from the University of Montpellier and uh, I tend to be a little familiar with 17th century cultural and intellectual history, having doubled in, the, uh, in this kind of field uh, for a few weeks, uh, weeks of years maybe, and uh, when uh, Anne asked me to come and chair this meeting, I was absolutely uh, delighted to have this opportunity, not least because uh, uh, it would only, only postpone, but did postpone, a rather tedious 20th century history class that I'm supposed to be giving just now. <laughs> uh, you know, you've got to make a living, they say. Uh, um, and also because it would be an occasion for me to uh, uh, um, catch up with uh, John Morrill and uh, it gave me an opportunity to catch up with some of his work. I came with my ammo here, uh, um, and uh, uh, this is, of course, something I mentioned at the beginning of the next session. But I'd like to say now, uh, uh, by way of introduction of uh, John Morrill's work, is that um, <clears throat> he is one of those people in British universities who have done a lot to make humanities research in general and the assessment and the funding of it um, based on sounder principles and on less managerial and more research and humane oriented uh, um, methods than uh, might have been or would have been uh, uh, the case otherwise. So this is something that in the context of this discussion of the uh, AHRC um, funding possibilities uh, had to be mentioned uh, beforehand. Um, I spent four years between 2008 and 2012 as head of one of the 26 French research centres abroad in Oxford, the Maison Française, uh, and I had the occasion to observe how these uh, institutions, the research councils, uh, were operated um, and how our own funding systems have begun to operate and uh, with satisfaction and dissatisfaction uh, uh, in many cases and I must acknowledge for myself that it's more often with dissatisfaction than the opposite but um, as John said in an interview that he gave a few years back the research councils have radically changed the way that humanities research is funded and practiced. Um, so not always for better, but very often for the better, uh, uh, as he then said. How, why can we here in this part of Mediterranean Europe share in those benefits or contribute to research projects in the early modern period uh, uh, on the British Isles? And I'm using this phrase because I know who is speaking right after me and what this phrase means. Uh, to him, uh, this is what we're going to explore just now. So please, John. Bonjour. Um, if I speak too fast, um, slow me down. I mean, it's, it would be heartbreaking to not be understood because I just get carried away, which I do very easily. Yes, uh, uh, the reason why I'm here to talk about this subject is because I have been very involved uh, since about the year 1998 with a major development in the United Kingdom and in Ireland um, in funding collaborative research. Now, not by creating great big research centres, which can do very good things but tend to be rather amorphous, but by having highly focused teams of people working on specific projects funded either by um, government bodies or by charities. For various reasons, I prefer to work with charities. Um, and always get, but I'm, that what I'm doing at the moment is with charity. But I was, for uh, several years, the person responsible for designing the programmes at the Arts and Humanities Research Council. So the government, the UK government, created a series of research councils for different higher education activity. So medical research council, uh, uh, engineering and physical uh, sciences research council, um, 
Economic and Social Research Council, Arts and Humanities Research Council. So um, th there were bureaucrats, as it were, running the whole thing, but there was an academic running the committee that designed the programmes, and I had the great privilege of doing that at a fairly early stage. And um, our targets were both to support individual researchers by allowing them to have time off from their teaching in order to, to further their, and particularly to complete their um, research projects. It had to be to complete because the government needed to be able to check that value for money, and the only way value for money was if there were outcomes. So you couldn't do it to start research but also to get to do collaborative research, and it's that side of it that I'll be talking about. I then had the great advantage of being a consultant when the Irish government set up its own research council in the humanities and social sciences. They've done things slightly differently, but they too are funding the kind of collaborative research that I'm going to illustrate to you in the next half hour or so. <clears throat> I also got very involved, since I, if you don't mind me being a bit autobiographical, something you could sort of, you, you, you could eat your heart out for here in any country other than Ireland. The man who owns most of the world's duty-free shops at airports is trying to give away five billion, five billion euro. His rule is, if you ask him for money, you are blacklisted for life. He approaches you. But he wanted to fund major research in Ireland because he saw the Irish economy, which was booming, would collapse if there wasn't in investment in what he called fourth level, which is postdoctoral research. So he gave 500 million euro to the Irish government if they would match it to create research excellence in Ireland. And I was the only humanities person on the, on the review committee for that, along with a lot of extremely um, aggressive scientists who thought the humanities should get nothing. So I got about 3%, which I think probably was, <laughs> was as much as you could hope for. So that's my background. Um, I have myself been involved in a number of collaborative projects. I'm happy to talk about those later on. Some of you may know the one I'm proudest of, which began as the Royal Historical Society bibliography um, online, and uh, which for many years was funded by the HRC. Um, after, uh, the HRC no longer funds it, so you now have to pay a small fee, about 30 euro a year, in order to get it. I mean, I, perhaps your university subscribes to it. Do you know if it does? Do you, the British... British Probably nationally. But this, it, this now has, rather depressingly, 450,000 separate titles of books, journal articles, and um, essays in collective volumes on British and Irish history and the British overseas. That's nearly half a million titles. So if you're starting work on British history, you have some catching up to do. <laughs> um, what we did was a team of four of us, um, I, I led it, um, and about 200 volunteers from around the world, in fact. And what we did was to contents index those 450,000 titles. So you can put in a search word and it'll tell you whether that is a major aspect of the content not simply the title of those books, essays, and articles. So it gives, I think, the British, a huge, or those interested in British history, an enormous advantage uh, bibliographically. And I did that in eight years in the 1990s with, I say, a team of three others. More recently, working collaboratively between the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK and the Irish Research Council in Dublin. We, um, I was, I was the, the chairman of the management committee that transcribed 8,000 depositions of survivors of the massacres in Ireland in the winter of 1641-1642. That was probably the worst massacre in Western European history when the Catholics massacred Protestants 
because they themselves were the victims of... Uh, so we can go endlessly to who's to blame, but let's not worry about who's to blame. Extraordinarily, 8,000 survivors wrote down their, um, their, their experiences in three parts. Um, the first part was a list of everything that had been destroyed, so it was an insurance claim, and it was as reliable as any insurance claim. I, mean, I dare say insurance claims in France, as in England, are not 100% reliable. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, eyewitness testimony, what did they see, or for that matter, ear witness, what they heard. And the third is hearsay, what other people told them had happened. The difference is really important and, and the depositions have to keep them separate because eyewitness can be used in court cases and hearsay cannot. Do you understand hearsay? All right. So we've got an extraordinary resource um, about this extraordinary level of violence, but also, of course, how it's constructed, because the moral economy, the way in which people perceived and interpreted what had happened, is completely different in the eyewitness and in the hearsay. So now there's a whole team of people that all over the, the world, actually, doing PhDs, because previously it would have taken one person nine years to read them all. But now, but now we have, a, we, now we have, you know, because we had four people transcribing them for three years, they're now available online. And obviously there are huge design f features and methodological issues of how you do that. And I'll come back to that, if you like, later on. And then what I'm going to be talking about at five o'clock is my most recent research project, which is to stabilise for the first time uh, the, re the recorded words of Oliver Cromwell. That say all his letters, all his recorded speech acts, because in the 17th century, they had mastered the art of shorthand for taking down sermons. So we have what what's he's fairly close to, when he had very reliable stenographers, something fairly close to what he actually said. Now, the system of shorthand is as efficient as modern systems. It's just that quills are not as efficient as fountain pens or biros. So the real, there is some sh shortfall. But anyway, we are doing an edition, and for reasons I'll explain at five o'clock, this has never been done properly before. And so we're stabilising it in a new and, I think, exciting way. And the methodology is there. I will leave until the five o'clock session. So what you have to realise is in, in the UK, what's created this opportunity uh, is that um, funding for research in the universities was divided into two along to about in the 1980s, basically on the science model. Universities compete for block grants for research in a terrible thing we call, we used to call the research e um, assessment exercise it's even worse now, it's called the Research Excellence Framework. Um, and what we have to do is every academic has to submit the best of their work over the previous period, which is then reviewed, and then cumulatively, the university with the highest scores gets the most money. Um, and so that is a block grant which comes in to support the research activity of the university. And that, in the, uh, in the uh, humanities, essentially supports uh, individual research, individual research programmes. Now, separately from that, the government took quite a lot of money away from the universities and gave it to the research councils so you could compete on individual projects. We did create, at the HRC, some research centres, though for fixed periods. So, for example, one that might interest you, and you could look at its website. I didn't actually put it on here, I think. But the Centre for Editing Life and Letters at Queen Mary College London, CEL, is an important one. And that was a research centre. There was another one um, in... Um, there, was, there was another one in uh, Aberdeen for the study of Scottish-Irish relations. How far... Did Scotland and Ireland have cultural interchange over time? Nobody ever looked at it. So there were about eight of these. 
I was, I was always opposed to them. I thought we could do get better value for money elsewhere, but eight of them so that, uh, were set up. But most of the money went for an individual or small team to set up a project that would be transformative of the activity of research. Um, uh, initially, um, it, was, it, was, it was perceived as being doing for the 21st century what the Victorians had done for England, and I imagine, I'm pretty certain, happened in France, the 19th century converting manuscripts into printed text. It's so the great making of print editions, which had reached a peak in the late 19th century, now they were being digitised and made available online. Now, that was, the, that was the major idea, to take the ones that needed a lot of intellectual input, that wasn't just a matter of taking a man with a camera and filming something that was there, but actually creating an intelligent database. Uh, that is, and that's that I want to now move on to. Um, so the, the funding went for some research leave, though that normally went to people who were on per, uh, individual projects. Um, and it went to manage projects uh, where typically the, acade the leading academic like myself, we bought out for, say, 10% of our time. So 10% of my salary would be taken away and given to somebody else to do some of my teaching. And I would be freed up to hire postdoctoral students. So it's been a great opportunity for postdoctoral students. So on all the projects I've managed, we've had three postdoctoral students working for two to three years. And I've always made sure that they work on 80% contracts because the salaries are okay, and although they would get more money, it was 100%, they're so used to being poor students that 80% of a kind of uh, research uh, assistant salary, but that means that they get one day a week and in practice two days a week for their own research. So, that, so it, it's, it's career development for them. And I felt that's an important um, point. I think it's one of the reasons why I've always been successful. I will boast the success rate in applications for these sorts of grants is, is 11%. Uh, my success rate is 100%. Because I, because, partly because I, I understand what the reviewers are looking for. And one of the things they're looking for is, are you going to treat your researchers as drudges, or are you thinking about their careers? Now, there's a big new problem, which is just sorting itself out, and I have no idea whether this is an issue in France or not. But uh, the, driven by some of the research bodies, there is now a demand that when, when, when money is given for a project, it should be free to everybody. You can't charge for it. It has to be free to the world, open access. Are you into open access? And, of course, this is creating all kinds of difficulties, which I'll come to in just a minute, but it's, it's simply it's setting, setting the context. Open access, which, of course, is, is, is going to ruin a lot of publishers, probably ruin a lot of periodicals, and yet governments everywhere seem to be driving it through. Um, but it is a problem which we'll, we'll come back to. Now, um, I want to divide the projects that have been coming out. How do I get this back? It's gone dead on me. No. Oh, it's, it's completely died. Right. Oh, there we are. There we are. That's it. So what I put up, and I'll, I will make sure this is available on your website after the after the day. I've given you at the top end. I've given you a list of all the. Um, of all the funding agencies. What I haven't said yet is that you've got the research councils for government funded. You've got the British Academy, which I suppose the nearest analogue would be Académie Française. Uh, but, it, so it's a learned, it's a, but essentially it's given money by the government in a much more hands-off way. The British Academy is really important for seed corning, you know, for pilots, for giving you a few thousand pounds to trial something. And my advice to anyone doing it is, so we have that money, um, and then I've put the Irish ones down, as I mentioned, and then three massive charities, the Leverhulme Trust, out of soap powder. Every time you buy Persil, you're helping fund research. 
because uh, one of the Lords Leverhulme, one of them gave a big chance of shares. So a big chance of shares in this huge soap powder empire for funding humanity uh, research. So Leverhulme is fantastic. They're extremely uh, hands-off and let you get on. And I was told by the person who gives out the money that the, um, that the directors, who are all retired businessmen, love speculative research because as businessmen they've always had to watch the bottom line they've always had to think so they back they're speculative they like big projects that are that are just exciting but not certain welcome does everything to is a, basically a, a medicine charity but it does a lot of me, medical history history of science um, a lot a lot of intellectual history cultural history and the Esme Fairburn Trust, which is the least large of them, but is also extremely helpful in funding this kind of research project. So we've got all these funders. It's very good, of course, there are a variety of funders with very different cultures, so that if you, if you don't succeed with one, you can try others. But then I want to just briefly go through the types of projects. So first of all, there are managed projects. That's to say a major publisher... A major publisher will um, set out to create um, a resource and will use academics as advisors. Now, do you have EBO here? Yes. Yeah, okay, so you know. Nationally. Nationally, you have EBO. So, Early English Books Online, so this amazing thing that everything published in the English language before 1800, or everything published in any language within Britain before 1800, is available online. Again, they ha they, they, that happened really because, every, because a Yale team had spent 50 years finding everywhere in the world what had survived. So then they had a catalogue. Then the catalogue was microfilmed in 20 years. 50 years to produce the catalogue, 20 years to microfilm it, five years to digitise the, the microfilms. But now there are all kinds of academic involvement. So, for example, in, in, um, in Sydney Sussex College, Cambridge, no less, there are, there is, there are people who are persuading scholars to write uh, essays about individual items, to, to create this great database of commentaries on, on important things. So this is, this is going to become more and more uh, important than it already is. All the, go all the central government papers, all the papers re re around the Secretaries of State and the Privy Council, the centre of English government, have been digitised, again with a big editorial team of scholars. Now, that is extremely expensive. It's a deluxe version. I'd be surprised if it's over here because it's, it's hardly anywhere. I'm lucky because I'm an honorary fellow of Trinity College Dublin and I'm, I get it from that. But in fact, potentially, that gives us the whole of the uh, central operations of the English state between 1500 and uh, 1714 online. The Institute of Historical Research in London has digitised a great many public records. So all the records of Parliament, all the records, um, uh, um, uh, frankly, the other ones I use all the time, um, all the, all the um, statutes of the realm. Again, all kinds of public records. And that is free at that website but you pay a premium if you want to see some specific things. The premium is only about then £30 per individual. So, for example, the calendars of state papers, not the, actual, not the images of the originals, the calendars, can be got under this premium service. And then Oxford University Press has, uh, has just started digitising all its and other people's major editions of literary, historical, and classical subjects. It's called Oxford Scholarly Editions Online. So the Oxford University Press, which itself has a very long record of um, producing editions of all the major literary figures in, Engl in England. If you, if, if, if you are working on, as I know some of you are, 18th century literary figures, your bonanza comes next year. 
They started with the 16th and 17th century, and they've got, they're going back to medieval, forward to the 18th century, back to the classics. And not only are they now digitizing the whole of the backlist, they are approaching other major scholarly publishers to incorporate their editions. Now, this is costing Oxford University Press 25 million pounds. That's about 30 million euro. Because they're not, just, they're not just producing PDFs of the pages. They are turning into HTML. They're making it incredibly searchable. So when, if, every time you come up with a quotation, you can say, who else in history has ever used that phrase? And it's going to eventually have something like 3,000 volumes. 3,000 volumes. Which, will be which you can search across. So who after, let's say, somebody I talked to a few minutes ago, who after Lady Mary Wortley Montague, whoever quoted her? You see? Um, now, in addition to that, every time Oxford commissions a new edition of a major literary figure, or a major political figure, or a major... Uh, historical figure, that edition is being prepared specifically to be both in print and on Oxford Scholar editions online. So my Cromwell edition will be produced in five printed volumes, but also go straight into Oxford Scholar editions online. And that's creating headaches for me, because what I'll say, I'll show in the next session, is that we have quite a lot of documents where we're going to have more than one version of a letter or a speech. Now, how that's going to be displayed on the online one, it should be straightforward, but the problem is the way they've designed their, their practice makes it actually very difficult for them, and they're asking me to do some very awkward things to make it possible to do it. But it is a huge and important project. That's the managed projects. So then there are the commissioned projects. Um, so then there are the commissioned... Oh, I'll go, just go up a minute. I just said I hadn't quite finished. So, um, of which my Cromwell one is one. That's, say, a publisher commissions a scholar to do an edition. The scholar can't do it on his or her own. So the scholar gets money from Leverhulme or EHRC in order to produce the text which he's been commissioned to do for a major publisher. Oxford University Press aren't going to give me £300,000 say 350,000 euro, to do an edition of Cromwell. But they will take an edition of Cromwell, which has cost 350,000 to produce, and they will, they will produce it. That's where uh, open access is going to be highly problematic. I'm just under the wire. Some others that, uh, um, that might be interesting, uh, Oxford, Oxford, when the... The, 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 during the English Revolution, there the major attempts to reform the, um, the, the part of the, 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 um, the church, to replace the Church of England by, by a Calvinist Presbyterian system, such as the Huguenot had in France. That, that, those minutes are a million words long and had never been edited. So when Oxford took over an edition which somebody was producing as a PhD and said, turn it into um, a publishable ver thing, um, Oxford said, prepare it for both print and online. Because, he has, because Chad Van Dixhorn, one of my students who, who's done this, has three levels of notes. He has, he has textual notes. He has... Um, cross-references to uh, the Bible and other religious documents, and he has the usual explanatory notes. Um, and then another one which is coming out very soon, which I thought you might be interested in, is the great Hollinshead, Holling, Ralph Hollinshead, the great historiographer, the great the person who collected and published the great history of these islands, which, of the islands of Britain and Ireland, which became the source for so many historian and literary figures. Now, it's not yet finished, but you can see what they're doing at that website. That's the, that is the project website. And indeed, most of the projects I'm talking about have their own websites. <coughs> I think the, we have a Cromwell edition had one which flashed by. 
So the third, the third way in which research can be done is for a team of scholars to work on a project and then to find a publisher. They, the first thing you do is do the editing and then you find a publisher. So it's not commissioned and placed. And the two examples I'm giving there are the Roger Morris entering book, um, which is only available, like the West, uh, which is only available um, uh, in print. That is the great restoration. Sorry? Right. It's fantastic. Yeah, they're, they're, both, they're both fantastic editions. But you see, they're collaborative. The Westminster Assembly was one man, Chad Van Dixhorn, who did a million words of transcription. And I tell you, it's the worst handwriting I've ever seen. Um, and he just became a master of it. The, Roger Morris was, a, was a, I mean, if you know about Pepys, this, this is a Puritan Pepys without the sex. But it has all the politics, all the religion, all the every, texture of everyday life. It's in five volumes, five senior scholars doing that with one research assistant. So it's a different model. And that research assistant, again one of mine, spent three years finding, fi finding about, that, about, th about 100 words of text on 5,000 obscure individuals who are mentioned. He had to do about three a day. So, and then back, the great Richard Baxter, the, 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 sort of the absolute, the, the, well, the bishop of, of, um, of nonconformity, the leading, I think, the moral leader of, of civil war and restoration nonconformity, his great memoirs are a very complicated text because it was written and revised many times. That is being edited by uh, three scholars and two research assistants. And that will, I think, go, that has now, I think, been agreed to go into the Oxford Scholar Editions online. And then the ones that are free online, the ones that you can now immediately access. If you, <coughs> the ones I just want to draw attention to, um, the 1641 Depositions Project, which is, which is hosted at Trinity College Dublin, which has these 8,000 uh, survivor statements. This is, uh, if, if, if this is time I mean, I can, and you want to see it, I'll show you the amazing down survey, the, the most advanced ep episode of mapping in the early modern world. So in three years, the whole of Isle Ireland was mapped for um, who owned the land, what uses it was put to, what it was worth. They used 30,000 soldiers with chains and ropes to measure. And when the team had finished and they put the 17th century maps on top of a modern geo map, they were never more than a few feet out. The whole of Ireland, 10 million acres mapped. And you can, see, you can, go, you can borrow down to the lowest level on these maps using the, this extraordinary achievement of mapping. So it's very important in the history of science, very important in the history of geography, and very important because what happens in Ireland in the 1650s is that the amount of land owned by Irish, uh, Irish Catholics goes down from 62% to 15%. That's 47% of the land of Ireland was transferred from Irish Catholics to British Protestants, sitting on top of an Irish peasantry. That is what we call in England the Irish problem and why it's still been with us. I'm professor of British and Irish history in Cambridge and my, my um, uh, mission statement from the moment I was appointed in 1996 was something of the great English writer and humorist G.K. Chesterton. You know, you heard of G.K. Chesterton? He wrote in his History of England, the tragedy of the English conquest of Ireland in the 17th century is that the uh, Irish cannot forget it and the English cannot remember it. <laughs> and so my task has been to te teach the English what they did in Ireland and to teach the Irish it wasn't as bad as they think it was. It was bad, but not that bad. Um, then, if, you're, if any, a lot of you will probably work on um, uh, on subjects which involve clergy, um, this clergy the, 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 the clergy of the Church of England database has been through every diocesan record and has created career paths for every single person who is an ordained member of the established church. So, if you want to know anything about the clergy that you encounter in your research. That is a free resource online um, 
and that's, that's the URL. And for anything at all to do with, with early modern Ireland, another one which isn't very often, as you can see, UCC is University College Cork, or the National University of Ireland Cork, the, is the Corpus of Electronic Texts, or CELT, which is um, anything to do with uh, Ireland in Irish, Latin, or English, together with English translations. Fantastic resource, again, because many of you, if you're reading, for example, Swift, or you're reading um, a, a virtually any phone, another, another example, people who relate to the Irish history then the, the reception of Irish texts um, has become infinitely easier through. So that's just, that just gives you a cross-section. So what I wanted to give you was this sense that this enterprise of getting um, a small teams of collaborators, characteristically um, a, a, a principal investigator, a, a, group of, a group of senior scholars who are advisors, and then postdoctoral people, late 20s, early 30s, doing the really hard work, this model is producing fabulous results. Alongside, say, and it's that transformative in exactly the same way that in the late 19th century, the conversion of uh, manuscript into, in, into printed editions was transformative. But now, with the added advantage of searchability, the use of HTML technology and so on in order to allow you to move, move with great... I mean, I had, a, I had a PhD student years ago who did a thesis on the notion of the supernatural in early modern England. And the first two years, he was finding enough examples to be able to, you know... To, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm winding up. Uh, and um, now he could do it in, in two minutes. Put the supernatural into a search engine. Then it took him two years. So that was all I wanted to say. I mean, just by, so I wanted to introduce you to the way in which we've got, we go about how we funded it and give you some examples. And uh, I mean, I'm more than happy for you to ask me, if you write to me, is there anything on so-and-so? Because I've only given you, you know, a small sample. But I hope I represent, what I want to do is represent a cross sample of the kinds of projects, whether they are commissioned whether or not they are placed or whether or not they are completely free for, for all of us. Um, and um, I'll leave it that, and I hope there's a few minutes for me to develop anything you'd like. Is that all right? Thank you very much, John. Um, thank you very much for this uh, um, general overview of the uh, opportunities and methods that... Uh, uh, you've shared with us, and um, personally I must really express my gratitude for the work that you've done in uh, organising the um, bibliography of okay. British and Irish history, because uh, it's changed our lives. Um, even in the um, CD-ROM state of the project, um, but you know, with the uh, online accessibility Absolutely. Build project, uh, uh, our lives have radically changed, the lives of our students, definitely. Um, I'm a doctoral student of 30 years ago, and of course you, uh, uh, you know too well the sort of things we had to do uh, uh, to know of the existence of a book and uh, how long it took to know where the bloody thing. I mean, but the, I, I, I retire at Christmas, and my very, very last paper I've been asked to give is, is about the cultural shift in, in how you do research mm -hmm. in 2013 compared with, with 1967 when I started research. And it is, it is just, I, mean, I, I may or may not believe in the English Revolution, but I do believe in the revolution in scholarship. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, you said one thing about the uh, dangers of open access. Yeah. Well, one of the great things uh, in this universe of uh, um, academic funding, which is not conformed to the hypothesis that cosmologists have about the universe in expansion, if you see what I mean, is that it is. Many, we do have now yeah. open access databases, and of course, you mentioned the uh, magnificent 1641 depositions project. Now, uh, um, it is something that different uh, funding bodies and governments try to develop. Now, 
Um, um, it is a difficulty for the scholars, especially the junior scholars who produce this sort of thing, and for the publishers and journals, as you said. Mm -hmm. um, in Britain, they've begun to ask all publicly funded research to be made accessible for yeah. free. Now, how are things, or paid by the scholars themselves to be published, yes. uh, how are things going on this front? <laughs> At the moment. For, for a long time, the government simply wouldn't listen to the fact that if you, um, if, if everything has to be free, um, how are you going to maintain a proper refereeing system and how are publishers going to make any money? Um, there were two models. There was the model in which uh, scholars would pay up front. Yeah. And then the model in which everything would to be, be published, let's make it to be published. Yeah. Yeah. Very, much, very much the way the Germans, the Germans have been doing it for a long time. But they, they said money would be made available to universities. That of course is completely I mean they're talking about two thousand pounds for an article. And of course that would not independent scholars and retired scholars, <laughs> where would they be? They're looking forward, aren't they? And of course, and of course, the problem is there wouldn't be yeah. enough money. These things never work out. Now they're talking about the green model, where they will uh, they will appear uh, in, in paid-for journals, but after three years, it will become free. Mm. But I mean, you know, a lot of librarians are going to say you'll just have to wait. Mm. You know, three years time, you get it free. So we're not going to pay for the first three years. And of course, uh, there are two, the, the, there's two things. One is the extraordinary greed of some journal publishers, yes. particularly Dutch ones. Mm -hmm. Let's name them, you know, <laughs> Clower <laughs> and Reed Elsevier. Yeah. I mean, Elsevier is a They've wonderful set, publisher since the 17th century. Yeah. They were putting up in two, I mean, in, in Anglophone countries, two thirds of library budgets were going on buying science journals mm -hmm. because a leading science journal was costing thousands of pounds a year. So the greed of those publishers did need to be challenged and that's why lots of people threw their light, lots of people support open access simply to destroy the power of them. The other thing which is much more serious, I think, is the wiki world of people who don't like peer review and think everything should be published and let, and let the world sort it out. Well, it's a, it's a, it is simply not the case that if you put, because bad research gets into the, into the system, and once it gets into the system, it's very difficult to drive it out. So the idea that everything's just published, everything's put on the web, everything goes into a wiki world, that there are people, particularly in America, who believe in open access in order to create a wiki world rather than the refereed world. Um, you know, you, I mean, there may be a debate about that. I would, I would think that would be very serious myself. But I mean, I, to, to any, I mean, you, I, I, I deliberately rushed by polys of time, but also if you want to talk about the methodology of any of the projects that I've talked about, the problems. I mean, I'm telling you about the fundamental mistake we made in the 1641 project, if you like. Um. Um, yeah, just to get down to very practical questions here. Our, um, Head of research the, of the history team, um, who happens to be a 20th century historian rather than early modernist, is engaged at the moment in trying to get us to answer European projects in history, in particular in, in British history, because that's, that's what we are doing here. And I mean, she could talk for a second, but one, what, one of the problems we have is that we never really know where to start. We never, we are not given practical advice on how ambitious, for instance, right. we should be. What shall we aim for? Shall we aim for one million? Shall we aim for yes. 500? Shall we aim for 5,000? How do we work? And if we do want to, 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 to get in touch with, with people who have expertise and, and, and experience in this sort of things, what, what, what do we do? Because as French people working all the time as British historians, oddly well, enough, we can feel a little bit isolated sometimes and we don't have any idea what the big picture out there yeah. is. So would you have practical details? Well, I, I, you know, one of, one of the great things about being in university like Cambridge is that we can usually get some money for trials and for pilots. When I, was, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I was at the, at the HRC, I was really keen on, on having money for pilots. Uh, because, so let me take the Cromwell Project as, a, as, as an example. Um, I got a grant from the British Academy 
to get someone to do a scoping exercise. How many, how, go through the existing editions and see how many of the texts were readily available and how many were missing, to get a sense of that. We got, we got some money from um, at the, what's called the Long Room Hub, which is a research centre in Dutchess College Dublin, to do a, a pilot on editing a small group of, of Cromwell's letters from Ireland. And we got, um, we got a collaborative your, your small European network grant to get people together to show them some of the big issues, to, to, sh and to have, a, have, a, have 20 people in a room from all over. It had to be three universities in three different countries. And we got, we got 20 people together and we looked at how we deal with certain absolutely characteristic issues, like what would we do with the many, many pro-formers, you know, the, the commissions, the um, warrants, you know, documents where they were simply a pro-former with, with a name in it, and commissioning someone to be an officer, commissioning someone to pay money, just with Cromwell's signature on it. What should we do with those? Should we exclude them? Should we include some of them? Should we include? What were the issues? How problematic might that be? Should we should we uh, modernise the language? Given that in a very high proportion of cases it wasn't Cromwell's spelling and punctuation, it was a copyist spelling and punctuation. How important was it to, to retain the spelling? And if we had different versions, how important was it? to um, note all the differences between different. So as a result of those three exercises, I was able to write a much more authoritative thing. Oh, and then, and, uh, it, like so there were two things. There were two things. Could I persuade myself whether I could finish in, th in three years? <laughs> could I persuade the funding body <clears throat> that I was being rational? When I, when I, was, in, when I was at the HRC, I didn't, I didn't actually on the home make the decisions on who got the money. I was designing the programmes, but I didn't sit in when the money was being handed out. The number of people who always ask for one pound less than the maximum is never credible. They're asking, they're not going to ask, they're almost always asking for less than they need. So I said always ask for, and the other thing is, that, that's imagine as a funder, you've got 10 million euro to give away, and um, uh, you've got, you, can, you can give 20 grants of 500,000 or 40 grants of 250,000. Now, you're going to want to make as many people as possible happy. So you're always going to give, mo give more money to people in the middle because you can spread a lot more happiness that way and they're usually more credible. <laughs> so people who ask for £499,999 very, very rarely got it. So there's, th there's things like that. I mean, there, there's things what we, what we call grantsmanship. But I think piloting is the all important it's, thing. It's the important thing. We, I mean, very useful to know. I mean, with the, with the bibliography project, with the bibliography project, I had got a very good, I'd worked out roughly how much it would take to, because we were using scanning of a lot of huge number of existing bibliographies and then as uh, sort of deduplicating. And I'd worked out roughly how much it would take, but the actual checking, because although our scanning in 1993 was 99.1% accurate, nine in a thousand characters being wrong is a lot of characters. And I suddenly found I needed to raise another £75,000. And to get supplementary grants is really, really difficult. I did it, but that was that because I hadn't allowed enough for the second checking. I got, I, so again, a proper pilot would have probably, if we'd done a small, a small sample, we'd have realised that we had to build that in. Of course, it would have been extremely unattractive in a main grant. And what we did was we got every PhD student in the Faculty of History in Cambridge was offered six hours a week at that, those days, seven pounds an hour. So it would be, now it would be, I suppose, about 12 pounds an hour. Which was so they were all so they're all getting a nice little additional money, but they and they could do it in the hours when they wouldn't have been doing productive work in the library anyway. But they were having to just go through checking for for the scanning errors, um, and uh, we we did it. It was seventy five thousand pounds of checking, which gave you know made Cambridge graduate students the envy of the world. <laughs> Thank you. I, okay.
got time for another question, or maybe are we maybe a short, a short, short question? If you, um, John. Yes, please. Yeah, hello. I'm just wondering how you assess value for money. Right. For a project. Um, In 15 seconds. Sure. Very <laughs> important. Yes, very important. <laughs> very important topic. Uh, value for money always meant completability. That we'd actually would be something at the end of it, and it had to be. Is it only? It's like any kind of research, really. Is it only going to be used by the immediate users? Or is it going to be used by much wider communities? Is this going to? Is it, are there other ripple effects going to be, you know, much more considerable? So if you're doing Cromwell, it isn't only people writing biographies of Cromwell who want it. It's not even people who study in the 17th century because Cromwell is now a really interesting figure. As I'll say after the break, you know, as an iconic figure in British culture, and so being able to locate him in that, um, it, and also the fact that he was a, he was someone who was um, at the centre of a great deal of public discourse, who were not in the academy. So if you were also reaching out, so the 1641 project. Although, of course, it's led to a lot of PhDs and so on. When that was launched, it was launched by the President of Ireland and by Ian Paisley, the Chief Minister of the North of Ireland, because getting the history right is part of the peace process. So it has to, to be relevant for the present? Yes. Well, that, it, it doesn't have to be, but if it can be, that's a bonus. That's a real bonus if it can be. It's part of the argument for the... Yes. Uh, well, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not essential, but it is. Anyway, the bibliography project has been used by, by children in, doing projects in schools. It's been used by undergraduates, by gen members of the general public. I was talking to somebody on Saturday who had written a little, a little paperback about, about his ancestor. Who was, a, who was a colonel in the Civil War, and he told me he couldn't have done it without the bibliography. And, you know, this for him was a, was a one-off. All right, we... Yeah, we shall have a short break.